Today's video is sponsored by Campfire, a writing program that we will be reviewing later. So I'm not saying that we're going to spend the whole video talking about literally the best mental character to ever exist, fight me Uncle Iroh, mental to scurry me scurry face, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we primarily explore the mental character through their relationship to the protagonist. And to ensure that they function within the narrative, we will mostly examine one critical element of their role, the character arc catalyst. We're going to split this into 10 parts. Kind of insight, emotional difference, mentors and negative arcs, the action reaction scene, the emotional opposition scene, the lesson action scene, humanizing mentor characters, design, and killing mentor characters. So by nature, the mentor character espouses some form of insight that the protagonist does not yet know. But what kind of insight do they need to have? In K.M. Whalen's fantastic book, Creating Character Arcs, a good point she makes is that at the heart of any character arc is the lie. He is harboring some deeply held misconception about either himself, the world, or probably both. Your character may not even realize he has a problem. What matters in writing a mentor character is the relationship they have to that lie the protagonist believes. And the role of that relationship will change depending on whether the character has a positive arc, changing for the better, or a negative one, changing for the worse. In a positive arc, the mentor has specific insight into the truth that the protagonist does not yet believe. In The Last Airbender, Zuko believes that his self-worth and his honor comes from the approval of his abusive, manipulative, domineering father. He doesn't even realize that this is a problem. <sighs> the only way to regain my honor is to find the Avatar. He sees it as the truth. This is the lie he believes, and it is the one that Iroh struggles to break down. <sighs> I know my own destiny, uncle. Is it your own destiny or is it a destiny someone else has tried to force on you? I have to do this. I'm begging you, Prince Zuko. It's time for you to begin asking yourself the big questions. Who are you and what do you want? But Iroh doesn't just espouse the odd piece of wisdom relevant to the plot, like a hint from the dungeon master, nor does he know the answer to everything in the story. No, the relationship dynamic he has with Zuko works so well because it is very particular. Iroh has a specific and important truth about life critical to Zuko's character arc, that your destiny is your own, and you are honorable because of how you act, and not because others approve of you. And the kind of insight they have relates to our second topic, emotional difference. The specificity of their insight is important because it is what makes the mentor dynamic effective. Insight seems hollow unless it characterizes major emotional differences between the protagonist and the mentor. Where Zuko is constantly angry, Iroh is calm because he has decided his own destiny. Where Zuko is anxious about the approval of others, Iroh is at peace because he only seeks the approval of those who love him. The difference between believing the lie and the specific truth manifests in the two characters from the very first episode. Unless you demonstrate emotional or physical differences between believing the truth and the lie, it can come across like a meaningless moral platitude, with no real bearing on the character's evolution. But don't be fooled, the truth can hurt. Knowing the truth does not need to make a character happier. In Lois Lowry's The Giver, Jonas is emotionally distraught when he learns the literal truth about his society, of the horrors of war, torture, and humanity's evil deeds. It is quite common in dystopian fiction or realistic sci-fi or fantasy for the truth to be a darker reality than the fiction that the protagonist believes. Here, the emotional difference is one of maturity that begs the question, is it better to know the truth or to be happy? This automatically generates internal conflict when the mentor shows what this person could become like if they accept the truth. But here's kind of the weird thing. The protagonist does not technically need to accept the truth that the mentor believes for them to undergo a positive arc. In the 2006 film History Boys, a class of boys are mentored by Hector, who believes that education is valuable for education's sake, and while we see in the story that there is value in Hector's wisdom, and the boys grow as people because of it, the events of the story and another mentor also show the boys that the purpose of education is to get a job and set you up for university and life 
financially, that it helps you integrate into society. A mental character does not need to have the whole truth. They could be wrong about or not know a lot of things, but be right about one crucial thing that matters. This is an idea rarely used, but it's one with a lot of potential. Nobody in our lives, parents, teachers, partners, role models, have the whole truth that we need to understand. When we see through lies and grow as people, the truth we come to is often a combination of insight from others and our own personal experience. In a positive arc, the mentor's role is most narratively satisfying when their wisdom is specific to the lie the protagonist believes. They may have the whole truth, or your protagonist may find value in their insight, but ultimately, they may see through the lie and find a different truth that builds on the mentor's wisdom. Iroh and Hector, though, are examples of a mentor in a positive change arc where the protagonist changes for the better. But what about negative change arcs or tragedies where the characters change for the worse? In this, the mentor guides the protagonist towards the truth, but the protagonist ultimately rejects it, leading to their downfall. We can see this in Obi-Wan Kenobi in Revenge of the Sith, where Anakin rejects the truth that love is stronger than physical power. Love won't save you, Padme. Only my new powers can do that. This dynamic is usually the most tragic, because we can see what they were meant to become. We see the mentor fail, and mentors aren't meant to do that. But one really interesting point of tension for the mentor in a negative arc is that the protagonist's rejection of the truth is often rooted in the flaws of the mentor. This is in usually one of two ways. The mentor does not empathize with their struggle enough, alienating them, or they force them to make a decision that they have not matured enough to make. If they can't change, then the protagonist is usually condemned to a negative arc, unable to accept the truth. A clear example of this is actually Toph, whose brash and forceful mentoring in Avatar and lack of compassion for Aang caused him to initially reject earthbending and its philosophy. In most mentor relationships, the mentor pushes back against the worst inclinations of a character and fosters the positive inclinations in hopes to bring them to the truth. But this runs into a problem that John Truby recognized in The Anatomy of Story. You never want to create characters that sound like a mouthpiece for your ideas. Good writers express their moral vision slow and subtly, primarily through story structure and the way the hero deals with a particular situation. But how does the mentor bring the protagonist to understand the truth without becoming a walking, talking, thematic mouthpiece? How do they actually mentor the protagonist? Let's discuss three important scene types that you can use. The first is the action-reaction scene. In the action half, the character has a goal, they meet an obstacle, the outcome is usually disastrous, and in the reaction half, they react psychologically to the outcome, they face a dilemma, and they make a decision. In Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry wants to learn to conjure a Patronus, fights a Bogart, but he fails, he then blames himself, he has to decide whether to continue, and he does. This weaves into the truth that Lupin is trying to teach him. He can never forget his happiest memories in the darkest of times, because for all you plebs who don't read Harry Potter, you have to use happy memories to conjure a Patronus. The mentor in the action-reaction scene plays a very particular role. They make sure that the protagonist gets past at least one of these six steps that they would be unable to alone, and it is in working through the step that they see a little bit more past their lie. Which step will your protagonist struggle with the most in a scene, and how does this connect to their lie? In Prisoner of Azkaban, Lupin helps Harry work through the psychological reaction step, in talking about how he can hear his parents' crying voices before they died. In Avatar, Iroh helps Toph work through the dilemma step, in talking through how accepting the help of others does not make you weak. Each of Harry and Toph's isolation and failure shows us the consequences of them believing the lie, rather than just telling us. Harry, that he doesn't hold on enough to happy memories and happy things, and Toph, that accepting the help of others makes her weak. And this is interesting. Show us the positives and negatives to following the mentor. And be more interesting than just, if you use magic, you'll end up injured in a generic, non-plotter mobilizing way. The steps they struggle with are most relevant to their lie. The second type is the emotional opposition scene, and it's a little bit more subtle. This is a scene dynamic where the protagonist ends up in a different emotional state to where they started, and the mentor helps them reach that point. In the episode Sokka's Master, Sokka approaches Master Pian Dao to ask to train with him in the art of the sword. He is feeling worthless and despondent. Let me guess. 
You've come hundreds of miles from your little village where you're the best swordsman in town. I have a lot to learn. You're not doing a very good job of selling yourself. Your butler told me that when I met you, I would have to prove my worth. But the truth is, I don't know if I am worthy. Hmm. But by the end of the scene, Master Pian Dao has Sokka feeling hopeful and of worth when he agrees to train him. I will train you. Like with the first scene, the mentor plays a very specific role in the emotional opposition scene. They take an action that subverts the expectations of the protagonist. This confronts them and causes emotional change. The subversion, and this is the important bit, is because the action is usually motivated by the truth that they have that the protagonist does not. This can leave them feeling positive, like how Master Piandao unexpectedly gives Sokka an opportunity to train because he understands that Sokka's humility and uniqueness is what makes him strong. Sokka's emotions of worthlessness are based in the lie, and Piandao's actions are based in the truth. But the emotional opposition scene can also leave the protagonist feeling worse. In George R. R. Martin's The Clash of Kings, Cersei mentors Sansa in the Red Keep during the Battle of the Blackwater, when Stannis is assaulting King's Landing. Sansa begins fearful but hopeful, believing that the men out there are noble and brave. Men must be very brave though, said Sansa, to ride out and face swords and axes. But Cersei unexpectedly shocks Sansa in talking about how she hates her role as queen. Breaking down this lie that all men and knights are noble, that Sansa believes by telling her about the realities of a bloody war, of death, of rape, and otherwise. In the end, Sansa is left doubting this lie of nobility, and she is no longer so hopeful in the battle. The only way to keep your people loyal to you is to make certain that they fear you more than they do the enemy. I will remember your grace, said Sansa, though she had always heard that love was a sure route to the people's loyalty. Sansa's hopes and emotions are based in that lie of nobility, and Cersei's unexpected actions are based in the truth of brutality, and it leaves Sansa doubtful by the end of the scene. What unexpected action will your mentor take based on the truth that confronts the protagonist emotionally and exposes a little bit of the lie? The third type of scene is action lesson, and it's the one that you've seen a bazillion times before. This is where a character acts towards a certain goal, and it goes horrifically wrong, and the protagonist has to learn where they went wrong to move forward. And of course, who gets to tell them that? It's the mentor. A horrific example of this can be found in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, where Edward and Al attempt human transmutation in a vain effort to bring their mother back from the dead, resulting in their bodies being splintered and mangled, and a traumatic ghoulish form of their mother remaining. Azumi Curtis takes them under her wing and she begins their realisation of the truth, that the human soul is invaluable and cannot be bought with magic. The action lesson scene is the most direct a mentor is when it comes to espousing theme, and relying too much on them can come across as heavy handed. Crucially, the emotional experience of their failure should change the protagonist to believe, accept or understand a lesson that they could not before, rather than it being a case of them just not having heard it in time. like. Oh, well, if you told me that before, I wouldn't have gone and done the stupid thing. One interesting subversion of this is where the mentor gives the lesson before the protagonist is emotionally ready, leading to them rejecting it, and this actually inspires them to go do the reckless thing. In George R. R. Martin's A Game of Thrones, Maester Aemon tells Jon that the men of the Night's Watch must have no divided loyalties to weaken their resolve. This advice causes Jon to abandon his duties when he learns that Ned is killed, which would have ended in his execution had he not been taken back by his friends. Only after making the mistake of leaving does he see the value in firming his loyalties to the Watch, which turn out to be a good, uh, mostly good idea, uh, spoilers, humanizing mentor characters. So one problem that we often see is that mentors aren't really people, they're just banks of infinite wisdom where you slot in a coin of personal failure and they happen to pump out the right fortune cookie. Because of this, they don't seem to have flaws, or the ones that they do have don't really play a role in raising tension in the narrative. There are three common methods that I tend to find work best. Firstly, using the action lesson scene to explore the mentor as a person. In Full Metal Alchemist, Azumi had actually practiced human transmutation herself long ago. 
so she was drawn to Id and El and understands their struggle. In Avatar, Ira was once someone who saw power as the most important thing, till it led to the death of his beloved son, Lu Ten. Brave soldier boy comes marching home. So it breaks his heart to see Zuko falling down the same path. The action lesson scene is typically most compelling where the mentor themselves has already made the same mistake. Phrasing the action lesson scene as an exploration of the mentor's mistakes, showing the protagonist his or her scars, literal and figurative, helps the scene feel less like a moralistic sermon and more like a genuine emotional connection of empathy between the characters, despite delivering the exact same information. It allows you to avoid the fortune cookie machine trope. Secondly, we talked before about having a mentor that only knows part of the truth relevant to the protagonist. And this works really well because it allows us to see their flaws play out in the story, humanizing them. Consider how the things they do not know might cause problems for them in the narrative, either leading the protagonist into a situation that is not right for them, or causing conflict between the two characters, or even resulting in the mentor's death. Thirdly, and this is my favorite because it is so damn simple and almost no one does it, giving the mentor a character arc. One mildly common arc is the cynical mentor returns to the fold, which can be seen in, oh, uh, uh, should I even? Uh, please, just, just focus on this little bit. The Last Jedi. Rey seeks out Luke, the mentor, but he rejects her as he has rejected the truth he once knew that the Jedi can bring balance to the Force. It is only Rey's persistent sense of hope and optimism that causes Luke to return to the fold and embrace his role as Jedi Master. The second mentor arc is not inspired by the protagonist. In Legend of Korra, Tenzin is meant to be Korra's spiritual mentor, but we soon find out that he has not yet connected with the spirit world as is expected of him. Eventually, Tenzin has to grow to accept that he is not his father, who could, and that he has not failed because of that. He is his own person. Which elements of your protagonist might confront the mentor with a truth that they forgot or don't know of? Which events in the story might confront the mentor emotionally? And now we come to killing the mentor. In 99% of cases, the generic mentor is killed because A, the author wants the protagonist to grow up, and B, they need to make the decisions. So... Think Aragon's Brom, Star Wars' Yoda, and Shakespeare's Falstaff. Now, I want to be clear, this is not a bad trope, but this is only one purpose that the mentor death can serve in the narrative, and it's what makes it feel so familiar for readers. And there are other ways of making the protagonist grow up and make their own decisions. In Avatar, Iroh is simply separated from Zuko, forcing him to make his own decisions and put Iroh's advice into practice. Only in embracing them are they reunited. This can also be more effective and meaningful, because the hero is now following their advice because it's worth following, not out of a sense of nostalgia or owing it to them because they died for them. But the easiest way to avoid the mentor sacrifice that some people loathe entirely is to give the mentor's death a second purpose in the narrative. In A Game of Thrones, Ned's death does not just propel the other characters forward, but it firmly establishes a central theme. All men must die, even perspective characters. In Artemis Fowl, The Opal Deception, the death of Julius Root is less used to motivate Holly Short, but to firmly establish how big of a threat Opal poses, the villain. She took down Julius Root when even Artemis couldn't. Thirdly, Remember how we discussed mentors having flaws? Having their death result from a personal flaw strictly distinguishes them from the sacrificial trope that people loathe entirely. In Aaron Ahaz's The Dragon Prince, King Hero is killed because of his warmongering past and underestimating his enemy. This also doesn't motivate Callum to act because he doesn't even know it happened. Instead, Ahaz used it to create a point of dramatic irony with one character willingly keeping the secret of his death from them. On top of this, the fact that Gandalf was killed by a Balrog in 1956 does not make the death of your mentor less meaningful. Killing the mentor will still be a strong emotional beat as long as we care about the relationship that those two characters had. The label of being a mentor is not enough. The reader has to see this relationship as a vital part of the protagonist's emotional makeup to care, 
How many times has a romantic lead been killed off effectively despite Romeo and Juliet? As a side note, killing the mentor is often used to force the hero to make their own decisions, but this is a common result of having the protagonist be somewhat passive in the first act of the story, with the mentor making the decisions about where they go, what they do, when they fight, when they don't fight. You can simply invert this and have the protagonist already making their own decisions. That way, it is natural for them to continue on their quest. That doesn't really change. Finally, designing the mentor. I've always been a big proponent of the idea that the aesthetic of a character matters less than the function of them in the narrative when it comes to originality. Just because the mentor is an old, sagely white dude doesn't make him a cliche if he plays a sufficiently unique role. Iroh wasn't a cliche, even though that cliche has been around for literally hundreds of years. But do consider alternate sources of wisdom for the character. In Dr. Seuss's How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and yes, we are going to talk about this, the old cynical dude is mentored by the young and optimistic girl, Cindy Lou. Yes, one of the best mentor relationships out there. This subversion is even purposeful and creative in Avatar The Last Airbender, where the crew go in a deliberate search for a mighty, masculine, muscular earthbender, only to find that his mentor is a blind, short, seemingly lean young girl. Wisdom and strength come with experience, and experience is limited to no demographic. So, to summarize, the mentor has specific insight into the truth that the protagonist cannot yet see. It can be effective to show the emotional differences between them because of this, positive, negative, and neutral. However, the mentor does not need to have the whole truth. They may be wrong about some things, and the protagonist may find their own truth, building on that specific insight. Secondly, in a negative change arc, the fall of the protagonist is usually facilitated by the flaws and mistakes of the mentor. This is often by not empathizing with them enough or forcing them to make a decision they are not ready for, causing them to reject the truth. This is also often a major source of tension in the story. Thirdly, in the action-reaction scene, the mentor teaches the protagonist by helping them get past one of the six steps that they could not by themselves. This is often the psychological reaction step or the dilemma step. This technique avoids moralizing to the reader because the mentor is never explicitly talking about the theme, but the action helps the reader explore it. Fourthly, in the emotional opposition scene, the mentor helps them by taking action that subverts the expectations of the protagonist. This decision is unexpected to them and causes emotional change because the mentor is motivated by a part of the truth that the protagonist does not yet understand, while a protagonist's emotions are based in the lie. In the action lesson scene, the mentor helps them by directly espousing a moral platitude following the failure of the protagonist. This is most effective when it is a truth that they could not have accepted without the emotional experience of their failure. One subversion of this is telling them too soon, causing them to reject the truth and actually do the reckless thing. Sixthly, mentors are commonly humanized by having the mistakes that the protagonist makes in the action lesson scenes be ones that the mentor has made themselves before, having the mentor only have part of the truth or giving the mentor a character arc. And seventhly, killing the mentor is an understandable narrative move to force the protagonist to mature, but give it a second purpose in the narrative. It will still be an emotional beat in the story as long as the author shows that they are a vital part of the protagonist's emotional makeup. Likewise, consider some unexpected sources of wisdom in designing your mental character. And while I do want to say a big thank you to Campfire for sponsoring this video, the reason I'm going to take so long to talk about it is because I don't just want to do a sponsorship, I want to do more of a review of the product. This is a writing program designed to help you put together characters, stories, and worlds. I was given this a few months ago, back in September or November or something, but I wanted to try it out extensively before recommending it or not, because unlike with normal sponsorships, this is to do with writing books. So it matters to me a bit more, and it might matter to you a bit more. I want to start by saying that I do totally recommend Campfire to certain types of writers. Let's get into why. Campfire has a character profiling feature, a timeline feature, a character arc feature, a relationship map, an encyclopedia tool, and a world building tool. The character profiling is pretty standard with what a lot of programs out there will have. It's customizable, you can add files for backstory, physical description, personality traits, whatever you want. Really useful, but if you're just looking for that, maybe it isn't for you. I've personally used it to actually go through my chapters 
and highlight pieces of description and personality like that I actually use in the book to, to catalog them so that I can keep my characterization consistent because I find that my characters often change eye color or something like that. But Campfire has two really unique things that I've found useful. The first being a timeline feature, where you can list the events, detail what happens, and draw connections between them. For me, I used it to mark out the first, second, and third acts of my book in a very visual way I had never done. I could see where my midpoint fell, where my darkest hour was, where the emotional story beats fell, and how well spaced they were. You know, how far is it between kind of the major emotional arcs of the story? And I could see if they worked within the overall narrative structure. I could see which parts and which scenes were superfluous. I haven't done this, but this would also be extremely useful for writers using multiple timelines, either because they're writing from multiple perspectives or because of time travel. And the second really amazing feature in Campfire is their character arc manager. I genuinely cannot praise this enough because I've never seen this anywhere else and it's such a vital part of our writing. But I may be a bit biased because I actually suggested this. I'm not on the design team or anything, but when they first sent me the product, they asked if I had any feedback after using it. I was kind of taken aback because uh, I suggested a character arc tool that allows you to map out how your character changes across the story. I want to give big props to them for actually listening to feedback and building that into their program. What really sold me on Campfire though, and I don't think I'd recommend it without this feature, uh, is that you could interconnect all of these things. You don't just list events in a timeline, you attach those events to certain characters so that when you go onto their profile, you can see the list of events that they're involved in. Similarly, you can go through the events of your story and attach character arc points to those events for a particular character. Even more so, you can pin events to parts of your map, which you can upload. You can literally map out the physical progression of your story with which scene takes place where. You're integrating character development with plot, with narrative, with setting, with character. Why I like this is not just that it is virtually impossible to remember how all of these things intersect all the time, but allowing you to not just record them, but connect all of them, helps clarify the way your story actually works, and the way it doesn't work. What I mean is that I could very easily see, oh, this scene doesn't have a character arc moment. What did they learn in this scene? And I can go back, I went back and I saw, they didn't really learn much. I could cut the scene. I could also see, oh, their relationship changes in this scene, and then it changes very quickly again. I questioned if that was too soon. If you put down everything you have into Campfire, you'll see which characters are useless, which scenes have no emotional dimensions, and which scenes interrupt the pacing of the story. If you make it so that every single scene, every event, has to have a character arc related to it, has to have a characters attached to it, that sort of thing. If you are a writer that really wants to focus on getting narrative structure and character arcs right, the fundamentals of your story, which should be everyone, or you forget about the details of your characters like me, then I totally recommend Campfire. However, it's not a world building resource, though. At least not yet. The encyclopedia allows you to create entries for anything, but there are other programs out there that are more oriented towards pure world building and map building. Some people prefer to start with the world, and that's okay, but Campfire isn't built for that. And if you're just writing very casually, short stories or poems, it's more oriented towards long form novels. It's also constantly bringing out updates though, and I can imagine it's only going to keep getting better. I hope you at least check it out, there's a link down below to them, and I also recommend getting it on Steam. That's just a slightly better product, I feel. But that is all from me, I hope you enjoyed this discussion on mentor characters, and uh, <laughs> this is a lot of work I've done over the last few weeks because this has been pretty intense, lots of really late nights, uh, which my girlfriend has been hating me for. But that that's that's okay. Um, I've still got a Civil Wars one for world building, which knowing my tendencies is going to be two parts. But I have a Blade Runner video essay coming up. I hope I can get it done in a week. Let's see how that goes. As always... Patreon, so on. Thank you to everyone who's joined up. You guys are 
absolutely incredible. I just cannot possibly overstate that more because this is my career, this is my life, this is literally doing what I want to do, which is education stuff, writing. I love it, it's a passion. And you guys made that possible. Um, all hail Mishka, haven't said that in a while, goodness. And uh, stay nerdy, and I'll see you in the future.